So a lot of people ask us to make videos to show some of the equipment that we use here and how we use it. And so anyway, today's gonna be one of those things. And just to, to put this in context, the name of the studio is Audio Mover, little plug there. And what we do here is we take old audio and video tapes and we turn them into digital. This of course is an audio cassette player. And, and so what happens is people around the country will just mail in their cassette tapes. They ha might have a recording of their, their kid's birthday party or bar mitzvah from a million years ago. And we get a lot of that stuff, but we're, we're, we're really, really known in the industry for working on large projects. And it, meaning, to give you an idea, we did a project several years ago for an organization where we did 115,000 cassette tapes for one organization. So we, we work with a lot of government agencies, churches, historical societies, that kind of thing. And they'll send them in in bulk and then we convert their cassette tapes into digital. Anyway, that gives you a little context of why I'm showing you a cassette deck today. Now this is kind of a unique cassette deck. It's, a, it's gonna be a little bit different than the kind of thing that you would have had maybe at your house or something like that because this is actually a four track cassette deck. Now, musicians back in the 80s or 90s would have used these kind of things. The reason these were manufactured originally was they were for musicians to basically have a home recording studio. And the way this would work is they would utilize all the all four tracks on a cassette tape to record music on. Now, let me explain something to you if you don't understand what I'm talking about. You might find this interesting. When you're listening to music on a cassette tape, let's say you have a, a this is what I'm talking about, normal, normal cassette tape like that. A cassette tape, when you're listening to it, you're listening to two tracks. You don't realize it because you think you're listening to one thing, but you're actually listening to two things. Hey, hold on for just a second. We'll get right back to the video. But if you like this stuff, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave any comments. We'd, we'd love to hear from you and we really, really appreciate it. Anyway, with that, back to the video. And what's happening is one of those things is being sent to the left ear and one thing is being sent to the right ear. Now to you, you th because they're in perfect sync, it just sounds like you're listening to one thing, but you're actually listening to two separate things. And, and where you would be able to, to recognize this, for example, I'll, I'll give you a really obvious one. If you went back and you listened to Led Zeppelin II, the song Whole Lot of Love, and you went into the middle of the song, and it starts making all those weird sound effects and things. There's parts where you'd hear it where something goes, and it sounds like it's moving from the left ear to the right ear to the left ear. You can actually hear it with headphones on especially, you hear it moving back and forth, or you get that impression that it's moving back and forth. But what's really happening when they were, were mixing the song in the studio, so they were basically turning up the left speaker and turning down the right speaker and then turning up the right speaker and turning down the left speaker, and it gives you the sensation, the illusion, that something's actually moving. But all that's really happening is that you've got two different recordings you're listening to, and one of them's getting louder while the other one's getting quieter, and it's going like that, and your brain interprets it as movement. So the point is, when you listen to music, when you actually when you put in your iPod and you or you're you're listening to your uh, your iPhone, you're listening to music on your phone, you're listening to music in your stereo, whatever it happens to be, you're always listening to two things. You're listening to a left and a right, uh, although you just think you're listening to one because they're in perfect sync. So now I had to tell you that because it explains why a tape deck like this exists. When you used to play a tape, like if you had these things, and you had a tape deck that you had in your car or your home stereo, and you'd put it in, you would listen to side A or side B. So when you think about that stereo imagery I just told you about, you had left and right on side A and left and right on side B. You basically had four separate things happening on the tape at the same time, but, you were only hearing two of them because the head, this little thing right there, was only reading side A or side B at any given time. And just so, so if for, just so you know, there's your, there's the oxide right there, or whatever. I think this might be a chrome tape. Anyway, the, the what your the the signal is right there, 
and you're listening to the left and right, and when you flip it over, you're listening to left and right. If you were able to hear all four things at the same time, if your head was able to do that, you would hear two, the left and right signal going forward on side A and the left and right signal going backward on side B and you'd hear them all at the same time. The reason you don't hear that, of course, is because your particular tape deck was only allowing you to hear the two things and then when you flipped it over, the tape head, this head, would just line up to the two on the other side. So that's how those things work. Now, what happened then is Tascam, which is actually a great, a, a really great company, and they make really good stuff. They developed this particular thing called the Tascam Porta O2 Mark II. They had a whole series of these things. It just so happened that this particular one is, is a real workhorse, one of the reasons we use it here in the studio. And we probably have one or two dozen of these things back in the, in the studio where we, where we digitize. So the reason they made this particular thing, so you'll, you'll notice over here on the left, track one, track two, track three, track four. If I were to put in a normal cassette like this, this is an old Scorpions tape, and were to play it, you could potentially hear left, right, left, right, side A, left, right, side B, left, right, all playing at the same time. So, so what we do here though, if we're playing, and that's, a, that's for a stereo tape. If we're playing a stereo tape though in this tape deck, we actually don't set it up. What we do is we turn it up so that we have side a, or left channel, right channel on side A, turned up about halfway. Left channel, right channel, side B, turned all the way down. And then on side A, we pan the left all the way to the left, the right all the way to the right, you'll see that, and then these, of course, don't matter. Now, uh, the reason that I'm talking about this or telling you about this in particular is that musicians, when they used to use these things back in the, the 80s, 90s, when, when a musician would buy this to record, what would happen is that they would enable these machines, that little head right there, utilized all four tracks. So then what they could do is a musician could plug in a guitar right there and a vocal right there and record into the left and right channel and then flip it and then record into the third and fourth channel and play a bass guitar or another sing another vocal or a keyboard or whatever and that enabled them to record all four tracks now on this particular machine what what our use here in the studio is only playback we never record anything on our tapes everything's always played back so we never use actually this part of the machine this part of the machine's all for recording. And you'll see right here, you have safe, one, two, three, four. And what this was, when you were recording onto this, this machine, you could turn on track one, which means if you hit record, it will record into track one. You turn it on to three, if you hit record, it will record onto track three. Sa same thing over here, track two, track four. And then, anyway, this, this whole part is for that. We actually never move it out of there because we actually never record over tapes here. It's always just playback. So, now, so th th again, this was what a lot of musicians used uh, back in the day to just record, kind of create their own little home studio. Now, for us, because of what we do here, because we move tapes through in bulk and we work our machines, we work them pretty hard. And it just so happens, this particular machine, the Tascam Porta 2 Mark II, has a pretty, it, it, it's pretty robust. And the thing, uh, other than we, we have a tech that replaces our belts and every once in a while, does, it does maintenance on these things for us. But for the most part, these machines hold up pretty well. And if you wanna know what machines last and what ones don't, we could tell you. <laughs> I, I think since we've had this business, we've, we've been doing this business for almost 25 years now, 
And I don't know how many we've, machines we've owned over the years, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 cassette decks that we've gone through. And I can tell you all the brands that last, all the brands that don't, all the old, I mean, we've, we've, been, we've tried everything over the years, just experimenting and using different tape decks for different things, and uh, it's, it's been quite a thing. Anyway, this particular model, these particular tape decks actually are pretty robust. They, they sound good. They, they work really, really well. They last. The motors last. Now, nothing's perfect. We do. They, you know, they do eventually die and what have you. But anyway, we, we, like I said, we have a dozen or two of these things back in the back. Now, there's a particular reason that we have this particular type of tape deck, though. Now, I was just talking about a minute ago how we get a lot of musicians that will send in their, uh, the, the, that, uh, that used to use these to record music on. But there's also another interesting thing. We get a lot of people, a lot of organizations that send tapes in from churches and government agencies. Now, a lot of government agencies, we're talking about courts, we're talking about county commissioners, we're talking about city councils that all recorded meetings for years and years and years, they actually used something similar and didn't realize it. So back somewhere in the mid 80s, there was this company that was called Lanier. And what they did is they took basically almost this identical setup and they went around all the government agencies and they sold this as a way of isolating microphones. So for example, these particular Lanier machines would use this idea where they would use all four tracks Instead of having a side A and a side B, they would just have one side, all four tracks going the same direction. And then what they did was they would say, okay, now here you, in your court, we can have the judge on one, we can have the witness on two, we can have the, uh, one, of the, one of the lawyer tables on three and one of the lawyer's tables on four. And we can have a microphone in each place. And then if you wanna go back later and listen to uh, any one of those things and isolate it, you can go back and play just the judge and turn all the others down and just listen to that one thing. Or if you wanna just listen to the witness, you could I, solo, solo it up. And so then what happened is a lot of these different government agencies, these, these courts, again, city councils, all these things that have multiple microphones, they would record on these tapes and then they, they would uh, not realize a lot of these people don't realize what they have. So what happens is we here in the studio will get these calls and a lot of time it's from somebody that's young, that that's never doesn't really know a lot about tapes in the first place. And these machines, because they will use, what is, all the tapes are identical as far as these machines are concerned. They're all four track. You, you, the tape that I showed you here, the Scorpions tape, it's a four track tape. It just so happens side A, side B, like I just described, kind of like that. that, that Anyway, that's how that works. But all the tapes are the same. Any cassette tape can be used in here. And so because of that, what happens is we get phone calls from a lot of government agencies that say, we got 500 tapes we need to digitize. And all of, the first thing out of my mouth is, do you know if it's a standard stereo, if these tapes are standard stereo or if they're four track? And of course, most of them have no idea what I'm talking about. But the old machines that they had, these Lanier machines, they don't exist anymore, they've been all thrown out or whatever, and all they know is they have a box of tapes that need to get digitized. And then what we do is we say, well, how about you send us, grab a sample of tapes from different years, send them to us, and we'll tell you what you have. And a lot of times what happens is we'll, we'll be able to determine, okay, all of your cassettes through 1988 were standard stereo tapes, and then everything from 88 to 96 or whatever, you started using the Laniers and now you have four track. And, and it just so happens because I've been doing this for so long, I just happen to know that to, in order to get the, the recording done correctly, you have to use a machine like this. It's basically, for all intents and purposes, it's the same technology that they were using in those, those other tape machines that were being used in the courts. But this one was made, while those were made for courts, this one was made for musicians. But it's fundamentally the exact same technology, just organized for different purposes. And so then what happens is then we'll get these different organizations that will send them in. And then what we're able to do, 
uh, is, is we can actually export all four of the tracks for them. And then, uh, anyway, it, 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 because they have all four recorded, if they were to play it on a regular tape deck, they'd hear, they'd hear track one and track two going forward, and then when they flip the tape over, they'd hear track three and track four going backward. And, and what we're able to do with these particular machines is get them, uh, get all four things sent out at the same time so that they're all in sync and you're hearing everything. Now we have two different types of machines like this and I'm just showing you one of them today. This machine, what would happen then after, a, for example, a musician recorded on here, they would create a mix and then you, exp you output it through what's here. You'll see that there's a left and a right output right there. And if we were just recording a normal cassette tape, we don't actually do copyrighted tapes, but this will just give you the idea. We would turn down basically that side B, and then on side A, we would pan to the left, pan to the right, and then what we do is we'd have the left and right coming out there. We would run those into one of our audio interfaces, into a computer, and then we would hit play, and we would digitize. And so then it would be, it, it would be something, you know, along, the, but, and that, this, I show that one because this one's for sure a left, uh, right, side A, side B. Again, this could be any kind of tape. It, it all, so what happens then is when these government agencies contact us, they have no idea what they have. And so then we have to actually get them to, to, to help them understand what types of tapes they have. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. But I'm gonna show you a couple of other things on here that are, that are kind of fascinating about uh, a machine like this. So one of the things that, that I wanna show you this, you're gonna, hopefully you're gonna find this really interesting. When you hit play, I want you to watch what's happening right there. Notice that this wheel is turning sl uh, faster than that one. And when you hit play, watch what happens here. That's your playhead. That's what's actually reading the magnetic signal that's on the audio tape. And then you have this little wheel that pops up, and then you have this little post. Now, I wanna explain what these things are, because this is so fascinating, and not a lot of people know how this stuff works or why this happens. Now, now th think about this for just a second. Why is that wheel going faster than that one? Okay, I'm gonna try a different tape that, that'll help you see this a little bit better. So we're gonna put this Scorpions tape back in. Now watch when I push play. Notice that that wheel is turning faster than that wheel. I want you to think back to geometry for just a second and that will explain what's going on here. Because all of the tape is on this side, the wheel the circle that's being, that the tape's going on to is bigger. The diameter of this circle is bigger right now because there's more tape on it, and the diameter of this circle is smaller. So the tape coming off of this one and the tape going on to this one, if it's gonna, if it's gonna be consistent, it requires this one's moving a little bit faster because the wheel's smaller and this one's moving slower because the wheel's bigger. Now watch this. If I flip this tape over, you will instantly see a difference. Now, this one's going slower and that one's going faster. Again, because you have the bigger amount circle here and the smaller circle there. Okay, now, so here's the interesting thing to understand about this. And I'm gonna put this tape in now because it's a little more dramatic when you look at the difference between the two. Look how much faster that one is going than that one. So, something to understand about cassette tapes is that they are in a constant state of acceleration or deceleration. These wheels are either always speeding up or are like this one, or always slowing down. This one's gonna keep getting slower and slower and slower because the wheel's gonna get bigger on this side, while this one's gonna speed up because the wheel's gonna get smaller. In order to keep the consistent amount of tape moving through, it requires that they both be going at different speeds and there will only be one time for an instant when it gets halfway through the tape that both of them will be spinning at the same speed. So now, how does this work? Why does it work this way? This is so cool. I'm gonna take the tape back out and I'm gonna show you what's 
happening and why that works. Why isn't one of them, while you're listening to it, slowly speeding up? And why isn't it slowly slowing down? The reason is, the tape is con- this tape itself moving across the playhead is always going at the same speed, even though the wheels are turning at different speeds. Now, I want you to realize something here. Even though that is turning at a particular speed, all that's really doing is just creating tension. This is not regulating the speed. The speed is being regulated by that little piece of metal right there. And I'm going to lift it up so you can see it more clearly. That's that piece of metal right there. That is called a capstan. And in some tape decks, it never stops spinning. It's just always constantly spinning. But when you, and when you push play, this little wheel right there, when it touches the capstan, the wheel spins. And what's happening, this is so fascinating, what's happening when you push play is that when that wheel and the capstan touch each other, you got the capstan right there, that little post, and the wheel, when it touches it, they literally grab the tape they're grabbing the tape and pushing it through to the other side. That right there. I want to show you again. So when you hit play, those two things touch and they grab the tape and they push it. And this wheel here is just creating tension. So that so that capstan is managing the speed. The capstan itself, that little piece of metal is always spinning at the same speed. And that makes sure that as the tape right here is going across the head right there, it is always going the same speed because that little piece of metal and that wheel is regulating the speed. These wheels right here are doing nothing but creating tension so that as it's as this is pushing it through, this thing is grabbing it and pulling it onto the wheel but this wheel is not creating the speed. Because as you see, this wheel is constantly slowing down while this one is constantly speeding up. Anyway, that's how these things work. And if you ever, I I can show you this actually on a reel-to-reel machine. We have a whole bunch of those things. If you were to disengage it, uh, so what happens when it gets to the end of the tape, you may have actually seen something like this on, a, on, a, on an old film reel. If you get to the end, then all of a sudden it goes really, really fast. It starts spinning. That's because the wheel was never regulating the speed. The wheel was simply creating tension as the, as the, little, uh, as the film projector was just feeding it through a frame at a time, the, ca- the wheel picking it up, was simply grabbing it and putting tension so that as it pushed it through, it would pull it on. And a lot of reel-to-reel players, what happens is as soon as you push play, the two wheels actually turn the opposite direction. So that one of them is actually having tension pulling it backwards so that it never comes loose off the wheel, and the other one's tensioning pulling it forward so that it pulls it on consistently, but, the ca- but it still has a cap stand and pinch roller. And this is true for these cassette players. This is true for your uh, your eight-track tape had a similar mechanism in it. it was, there's that was a little weird how that would work, but it was a similar mechanism. And the uh, and your your reel-to-reel players. Anyway, this capstan and pinch roller. And it, and the reason that uh, w- like a reel-to-reel player. The reason it doesn't just go flying off all the place is because as soon as you hit stop, it lets go of the tension on here and you can see that it starts spinning. They start spinning freely. But this one, as you can see here, as soon as I hit play, I can't pull it back or I could stop it and probably pull it back. But it it, it has a signal then at that point to trigger it. As soon as it gets the end of the tape, let go of the tension. And that's what I just did right there. And then you can see that it stops trying to feed the tape. Anyway, that's how that works. Okay, so that's pretty cool. <coughs> I'm going to show you one other thing on this tape machine that you're going to find pretty neat. If you, especially if you ever owned cassettes before, you may not have understood one particular kind of interesting thing. Now, if you look at a tape that you buy that was made by a that was by a, an artist like this. 
So for example, this Scorpions tape, and like I said, we don't digitize this kind of tape because this is copyrighted, but, but I'm using this to kind of show you how this, how this stuff works. So you'll notice that on these particular tapes, uh, this isn't a, well, you'll, you'll see in this one spot how this one has a hole. Ignore that little extra space right there. This is called the Write Protect tab. When you would buy a tape like this Scorpions tape that was manufactured by a record company, it has a hole right there. But when you'd buy one that was a blank tape like this Maxell, there isn't a hole right there. It, there's actually a little tab. That tab signals to the machine that, it's, that you can record on this tape. You can't record on this tape because that tab is missing, and I'm going to show you how this worked. Okay. So if I put this tape in right here, you'll see it won't let me push the record button. If I put this tape in, it will. Okay? Now, here's why. This is pretty neat. And it has everything to do with this little button right there. You can see how I'm moving that thing right there. When you, th and this was true if you own, ever owned a tape deck that you had the ability to record onto. When I put this tape in, what happens is that little button falls down in that little hole, and that basically tells the thing don't, to disable the record button, so you can't record over it. If I were to put a piece of tape over it, probably never going to play this tape, but I'll kind of show you how it would work. If I put a piece of tape over it, I'm going to rewind to the beginning so I don't record over any tape. Watch what happens. Now it'll let me do it. Because now that little button doesn't fall down. So it's whenever you would buy a tape at the store, it would always have that little tab. You'd put it in, and then it would allow you to record. Now, in this case, it isn't going to record no matter actually what I do because I have both of these things in safe mode, which basically turns off all the recording anyway. But that, that's how that little thing works. So if, if I recorded something on this tape and I didn't want to record over it, all I would do is take a little pen or a little small screwdriver or something and just pop that little thing out and then that would disable my ability to hit record. And that was because of this little write protect tab right there. And that's how that worked. Anyway, so this is a, if you were to come to the Audio Mover Studio, we're located in, in St. George, Utah. And we, we have all kinds of different tape decks for different reasons. You would see a bunch of these things as in, in the studio. Now, there are people who are musicians that recorded on these machines way back when who have those old tapes. They might have a tape like this that they had recorded their band on. They have drums in one track. They have the vocals in this track and a guitar in this track and a bass in this track. And there's a lot of people that contact us that say, hey, I've got these old tapes that I recorded on one of these machines. Or like, there were a bunch of different companies that manufactured these. It wasn't just Tascam. And they contact us and say, hey, I want to I wanna digitize it, and I'd like to then be able to mix it. We do have machines similar to this where we can export all four tracks independently. We actually do have machines that allow you to play back all four channels independently where we can actually digitize your tape. So if you had some of these things when you were a musician as a younger person and you recorded on one of these and you want to get the four independent tracks, you can send them to us and we do have machines that actually are able to do that where we can export each track independently and, and not just independently, but we export them all at the same time. Because that way you know that they're all going to be synced up. You know, you won't have any trouble of tapes slowing down and speeding up or things getting out of sync. It, we, we can actually export all four tracks at the same time. This particular machine, though, did not have that capability. This one only had the capability of doing left and right, and that was it. And so when people used to use these things, they would, uh, they would just do the mixing right here, and, it, and, and then 
say take the whatever music they recorded on this particular thing and then they would mix it down to a left and right ch signal and then they would ex send it out like this and then record it onto another tape deck or, or who knows what people use these for a lot of different things so in our case as i said if we were just playing a regular left and right stereo tape we would set it up like this where we turn up the volume for track one track two which is basically left and right on side a We'd pan one all the way to the left, one all the way to the right, turn side B, which is basically three and four, all the way down, and then you take the left and the right out right there, and and then you, you, you basically you get side A. When it gets to the end, you flip it over, hit play, and then side B plays. And in the cases where we have some of those tapes that have come from a government agency, what we're able to do then, for example, if they had, like I was talking about a minute ago, the judge, the witness stand, the whatever, we can actually just turn all of them up to a uniform level. And then what we'll often do is just center all of them, like so. And then, for all intents and purposes, we're sending it all, all four tracks out in those cases as a mono signal. Uh, we have other machines, depending on how you want it, we have other machines that can enable it to go out in all four tracks, however you want to do it, you know. But because some people would ask something like, well, if you're sending all four channels out, uh, mixing four channels down into a mono signal, aren't you going to have problems where you're going to have the uh, interference from the frequencies, where you're going to have phase, phase shifting or phase cancellation or something like that? And, and in reality, not really. Most of the stuff that we do here in the studio honestly uh, is, is just speaking it's voices it's very limited frequency range we've experimented with this stuff a whole bunch of a lot of different ways and it just doesn't seem to make a really really big difference and most of these recordings is just being done for archiving purpose and it it, it doesn't it doesn't alter the audio enough to actually make any sort of a real significant difference at all so most of the stuff that gets sent into the studio, even though this was used to record music on, you know, back in the day, most of the stuff that comes into the studio, we don't, it isn't music. Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we digitize is coming from a church or it's coming from a government agency. And really all it is, is it's a, it's a, a few microphones People, people talking into microphones, and then that's it. And and the human voice is a very, very limited frequency range. It doesn't it doesn't have the the, the high fidelity that you would want potentially for for music. And so anyway, this is a this is a great little tape deck. These things are workhorses. We have a whole bunch of these things. We have a wide variety of machines we use here in the studio. But this is one of our workhorses, and we can set it up for different types of tapes, as I explained. But we, we, we have a, a whole bunch of these things, and I've been very, very happy, uh, even though we don't record on these things, as far as a playback machine goes, I've been very, very happy with, with these things over the years. And like I said, we have a whole, whole bunch of these things. So anyway, hey, if you enjoyed this stuff, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave any feedback. If there's other things you'd like us to talk about, we have so many, we have a lot of cool pieces of equipment that are fun to talk about. And I actually have fun just chatting about this stuff. And we'd love to, uh, love to get your feedback. If there's anything else you'd like us to explain or talk about, we'd love to, uh, to do it. Anyway, with that, have, have yourself a fantastic day.